Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we're looking at part number two of a study that we started on the zombie apocalypse. In our last lesson, if you remember, we had looked at some of the reasons why people sincerely, honestly believe that we're going to have in the future a time when zombies will attempt and in some cases be successful in taking over the world. It'll be the end of the world as we know it. There are some people who even believe that activity has started already. In part number one of our series, we looked at some different reasons why people do believe that a zombie apocalypse is going to take place. And if you remember, a part of what we looked at in, in lesson number one was some Bible verses that people point to that they claim teaches that zombies exist and that as the end times get closer we're going to be facing a war against zombies where zombies will try and again some people believe be successful in taking over the world. What I would like us to do in this lesson, this is part number two of the zombie apocalypse, I would like us to look at those same Bible verses we looked at in part number one. But this time instead of simply reading the Bible verses, I would like us to examine them in the context of the Bible to see what do these verses teach? Do they teach in a coming zombie apocalypse? Remember folks, as far as I'm concerned, we all know that the Bible is God's word and the Bible is true. All we have to do is find one set of verses, or one verse, or one set of verses, that clearly speak about a coming zombie apocalypse, and that will mean the Bible teaches it. That's all we need is one set. Now we have nine of them to examine this morning. If just one of them in context teaches there's coming a zombie apocalypse, do you know what that means? There is coming a zombie apocalypse. So I just want us to understand that even if we can discount some of these because of their context, that doesn't mean there's not going to be a zombie apocalypse because all we have to do is find one set of verses or one scripture reference that speaks clearly on the fact there will be a coming apocalypse that involves zombies. And folks, that'll make it so. The Bible says what the Bible says. Whether we understand it all, whether we like it or not, the fact remains, if we can find just one set of verses that teach this, then we will know that it's true and that it's going to take place. So let's take our time this morning and look. We had looked at nine different Bible uh, references, nine different passages that people point to that claim is speaking of a zombie apocalypse. Let's see what those nine different passages are speaking about. And in this whole study we're looking for just one set of verses just one is all we need that will prove to us that a zombie apocalypse will take place let's take these in the same order we looked at in chapter or in uh, lesson number one we'll look at Zechariah 14 12 through 15 Zechariah 14 12 through 15 if you remember in our study last time these were the verses that talked about how you would have men standing with their flesh being consumed on them even as they stood. We went on to see how these same men who would have flesh that was consuming upon themselves, they would be attacking other men, and this would all be the result of a plague. For those who believe in a zombie apocalypse, and if they believe these verses teach that, they say, look, here you've got dead people. They're walking about. Their bodies are decaying on them even as they walk. They fight against human beings, and it's because of a plague. It's because they had this virus that infected their system. That's why they're zombies to start with. Okay, that's how they would interpret Zechariah 14, 12 through 15. What's the context of this section of Scripture? That's what I want us to look at. If we look at the entire chapter of Zechariah 14, not just these three or four verses, but the entire chapter... If you notice in verses 1 through 11 especially, it's speaking about Christ's second coming in the context of this. In verses 1 through 11, it talks about his second coming with his saints. What's going to take place when Christ comes back with his saints? He's going to judge the world for their sins. 
That's what verses 12 through 15 then is talking about. It's how God will send a judgment immediately as he's coming back with his saints. He will be sending a judgment forth to judge the lost. That judgment is described as having people's flesh being consumed away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will consume away in its holes and their tongue will consume away in their mouth. That's the mighty power of God's judgment against those who have sinned against him who will not look to him in repentance and believe. It goes on then and it talks about how in verses 16 through 21 the eternal worship of God then takes place. So what you have basically in Zechariah 14 is what? It's a prophecy of Christ's second coming. In verses 1 through 11, Christ is coming back with his people. In verses 12 through 15, God is judging the lost and consigning them to the lake of fire. In verses excuse me, 16 through 21 then, we have the eternal worship of God by his people. So in this case, in Zechariah 14, what we're looking at isn't a zombie invasion, it's the Lord's judgment upon those who have sinned against him and have not repented of those sins. It will take place the, <coughs> excuse me, at the last day to usher in the eternal worship of the Lord by his people. Let's look at Mark 5, 1 through 5. If you remember in Mark 5, 1 through 5, we had found a listing or, or a, an account, I'm sorry, of a man that some people believe was a zombie. Remember, this is a man that lived among the tombs. The Bible says he came out of the tombs. He could not be chained. He cut himself with stones. Some people say, well, that sounds like a zombie to me, especially when it says he came out of the tombs. Okay, what are we talking about here? The key to understanding Mark 5, 1 through 5 is what we read about this man, it says that he had an unclean spirit. That's talking about a z demon, folks. This man was a demon-possessed man. The reason why he did all these things was because a demon inhabited him. There is such a thing as the powers of darkness in the world about us. There is such a thing as evil spirits about us. The Bible is clear about that. You have Satan himself walking on the earth, walking about seeking whom he may devour. You have other fallen angels, otherwise known as demons in the Bible, that, in, at least in the Bible days, inhabited people. In today's time, I believe they oppress people, but I do not believe that a demon can actually inhabit a person in today's time. But in Bible times, they did. And this is a whole other lesson, but there are specific reasons why the Lord allowed them to during his reign on the earth, when Christ was here on the earth. But in any case, the point is this. In this case, you have a man who was possessed by a demon. It says he came out of the tombs, not meaning he literally came up out of the graves, but means he lived among the tombs. We're told that later in these verses. He lived among the tombs. That's where his home was. Can you imagine living in a graveyard? Listen, nobody wanted this man around. He was a danger to himself as well as to others. He was demon-possessed. The men of the city tried to chain him and he could tear the chains off of him because of the great power he had because of the demons that were within him. So this is not a zombie by any means. This is a man that was possessed by a demon. And what we're told is this. The Lord in the process of performing this miracle, the Lord in the process of healing this man, you can see in later verses, cast the demons out of this man. The man was perfectly whole. He walked about just as any other man would walk about. He had been cured by Christ. So in Mark 5, 1 through 5, if we carefully study these verses in their context, we find this isn't speaking about a zombie. This is speaking about a demon-possessed man. Christ intervenes in this man's life, granting him a healing from his demon possession. And following that, this man walked about whole and in his right mind, being accepted by those around him. The next set of verses that we had looked at is found in Psalm 27, 1 through 5. Remember here, this was a prayer that David had prayed. If you remember, the basic idea of this prayer was in Psalm 27, 1 through 5, <clears throat> you have David describing those who were his foes, those who were out to get him. 
And he described them as saying, They came upon me to eat up my flesh, but they stumbled and fell. And he was giving the Lord the glory for stopping his enemies from being able to get to him. Okay. If you notice in the context here, the ones that were out to eat up David's flesh, he describes as wicked people, mine enemies, and my foes. Okay, folks. If you study the context of when Psalm 27 is referring to in history, it's talking about a time during David's reign. David was king of Israel. This psalm was written during a time when David was reigning, when he was facing internal rebellion against his reign. In a sense, it was a mutiny of some of the people. The sad part was, one of the people mutinying against David was his son Absalom. David said, Lord, in my nation that I'm ruling over, I have enemies, I have foes. They've turned against me. They want to see me thrown off of my throne. They want to see me killed so they can take my place. Now, folks, stop and think about it a minute. When we eat food, what are we doing? When we eat food, we're partaking of something to aid us, to help us. That's why we eat. <clears throat> Eating is for personal gain. When David describes the enemies in his kingdom, meaning Absalom and those who were following Absalom, when he describes them as wanting to eat his flesh, he's not literally talking about them wanting to come and chomp down on his flesh with their teeth. He's saying, they want to help themselves to my kingdom. They want to eat my kingdom. They want to bring the kingdom to themselves. But how do they do it? at David's expense. They want to hurt David and by hurting David they're going to gain the kingdom. Isn't eating David's flesh the perfect picture of that? You know it's like when we eat a fried chicken dinner. We're eating the fried chicken for gain but guess who's the one that lost in the deal? It was the chicken, right? Because he's now dead being consumed. That's why David said his enemies that were against him, it was like they were eating his flesh. They wanted to gain the kingdom, but they wanted to do it at David's expense. So they were out to harm David. They were out to destroy David, pictured by them eating him. But in the same time they were destroying David, they were gaining the kingdom. They were gaining the power to reign. They were gaining the rulership over Israel for themselves. That's why David describes his enemies as eating his flesh. <clears throat> if you notice, a part of the action against him was encamping against him and creating a war against him. He talks about that. He says, they should, Though thy host shall encamp against me, my heart should not fear. Though war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. Folks, let me tell you something. If we go with the picture of a zombie like people make zombies, they're basically mindless people. They don't camp against anybody. They don't set a camp. They're mindlessly, aimlessly walking in streets and walking in cities. They couldn't even know how to camp out if they wanted to. They don't... <clears throat> they, again, remember, only a certain part of their brain has been animated to help them to walk and to talk and to eat. They don't can't talk, but to walk and to eat. So you can see David is talking about an intelligent, organized faction of people that was out to take his control. They would encamp against him and they would make war against him. They weren't just mindless people walking through the cities trying to eat his flesh. He described this as being organized. You can read about this time in David's reign in 2 Samuel 15 through 2 Samuel chapter 18. This is the time he's talking about in Psalm 27. Again, it's when Absalom and Absalom's followers were trying to cast David out of the throne. They hunt David down like an animal is what it is. So if you read these chapters, you find David is fleeing from them. It's like they're tracking him down like an animal trying to kill him. And he keeps praising the Lord, saying, Lord, you've kept them away from me. Even though they want to destroy me and gain from it, pictured by eating his flesh, he was praising God because the Lord was protecting him from it. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Here we find in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, 
a prophecy about dry bones that are brought back. They are, they're raised up. You find the flesh and the sinews coming upon the bones again. You have breath being put in the people and they are walking about. Okay, if you remember, we looked at this prior. That's what that's a picture of. That's what this is speaking of, in other words. What is this? Okay, first of all, we have to please notice this isn't an actual event that takes place, and this is important. This isn't an actual event. This is a vision that Ezekiel is receiving from God. It's a vision that teaches Ezekiel a truth. So, folks, this event never literally, nor will it ever literally take place. You will never have a valley of dry bones that pop up, You'll see the flesh and the sinews come upon them and you'll see an army walking about. It will never literally take place. This was a vision God was giving Ezekiel to teach Ezekiel a truth. What was he speaking about? The message is explained in verses 9 through 10 and verses 11 through 13. Now here's what the message was. This is the lesson he was teaching Ezekiel. Ezekiel would preach to the nation of Judah. They would respond to his message and Jehovah would send a great revival to the land. He would allow them to return from the Babylonian captivity that they were experiencing. Okay, here's the idea. You got these bones laying out in this valley. That's a picture of Israel being captives of Babylon. It's like they have no more life left in them. They have no hope. They are now the captives of Babylon, and apart from God's intervention, they're through. Pictured by dry bones laying in a valley. No hope whatsoever. But then the Lord intervenes. He sends Ezekiel to preach to them. As Ezekiel is preaching to them, the Lord intervenes, and he raises them back up to life again. A picture of the fact he's going to deliver them from their Babylonian captivity. So now these dead bones that were laying in a valley that you thought had no hope are suddenly revived and brought back into the land of Israel. They come back to the land of Israel and now it's as if they are a great army ready to worship the Lord and do his bidding once again. But if you notice again in the context, if we keep this all in context, it's through Ezekiel's preaching that this takes place. Ezekiel would declare the words of the Lord, the people would listen, they would repent, and you would have deliverance from the Babylonian captivity. That's basically what this vision is about. <clears throat> Those who were rebellious and dead to Jehovah would be brought back to their land and experience a relationship with God once again. This death is a reference to separation. Separation from God because of their sin. Their restoration is a picture of life being given back to them as well as communion with their God. It stems from repentance at the preaching of Ezekiel. That's basically what we're talking about there, folks. It's not a prophecy that would literally take place. It's a vision helping Ezekiel to understand. Ezekiel, if you preach to the people faithfully, they will listen, they will repent, and the people will be restored back to their land. Let's look at Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Okay, this is the account of, if you remember, after the Lord died on the cross, you have the bodies of the saints arising from the graves. They go into the city and they walk about and they appear unto many. What's this talking about? Well, as I explained in lesson number one, keep in mind there is such a thing as literal resurrections that take place in the Bible. They have very little and similar to what we think of as a zombie. This in Matthew 27 is simply a resurrection that takes place. You have dead saints who are in the tombs. When Christ died on the cross, he won the victory over sin and over death. That was proven at his resurrection. At that point in time, you have these bodies coming out of their graves to prove the fact that Christ had gotten the victory over death. Also, the saints' bodies coming out of the graves are a, are a, it's like a, a teaching for us to know our bodies are going to do the same thing. What we saw happen with these saints as they arose from the dead, our bodies are going to do the same again someday when Christ comes back. 
So what we see here is the direct result of Christ's death on the cross. It wasn't a virus that caused this, this uh, resurrection. It was the death of Christ and his victory over death that he gained that was proven by his resurrection. Christ arose, these saints arose. Why? It proves that God is almighty. He has the power over sin and death. These saints walking about was proof to everyone that Christ truly is Lord over all and he had gotten the victory over sin and death. And it's through repentance and belief. If we repent of our sins, if we turn from our sins and turn to the Lord, if we change our mind about our sins, where if we see our sins for what they really are, rebellion and hatefulness in God's sight, if we see that's what our sins truly are and if we turn to him in repentance, and then if we trust in him as not only our Savior but our Lord, we will be saved. And we will be able to experience a type of resurrection too. When Christ comes back, our dead bodies will be resurrected. It will meet our spirits in the air and glorified. And we will then spend an eternity with the Lord. That's all a part of what these things are trying to teach us as we read about this resurrection that took place following Christ's death. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. Here we have Paul giving a warning to God's people. It's a warning about the need to teach e to treat each other in a proper way. We should treat other believers with love. We should treat other believers with kindness. One of the ways that Paul expresses that is, he says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You remember when we looked at Psalm 27? We said there that David was describing the enemies in his kingdom. And the way he described what they wanted to do with him is he described them as wanting to eat his flesh. <clears throat> Remember what we said the idea was? They were gaining at David's loss. They would be hurting David and at the same time gaining. That's pictured by them wanting to eat his flesh. Got the same thing here in Galatians. When Paul talks about us biting and devouring one another, what Paul is saying is this. We should treat each other with love as Christians. We should put other Christians before us. We shouldn't be selfish when we deal with other Christians. We should want to help other Christians, even if it's at our own expense. But Paul goes on and says, if we don't do that, if we live selfishly, if we put ourselves first and other Christians second, it's going to be like we are biting and devouring them. We're going to hurt them so that we might gain. So Paul says, look, if we don't love others like we should, if we live selfishly, hurting others for our own good, he says, if we bite and devour one another, what will take place? Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Paul says, don't be surprised if people treat you that same way. It's human nature, folks. When we mistreat others, Human nature would have them treat us in the same lousy way we treated them. So Paul here is making an argument for the need for Christians to love one another. The need for Christians to care for one another. The need for Christians to love one another. And then he shows the exact opposite of loving one another, which would be biting and devouring one another, hurting others for our own personal gain. How about Psalm 53, 4 and 5? Psalm 53, 4 and 5. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread? They are not called upon God. Okay. Here we find that we have people who are called workers of iniquity, those who commit sin. They have no knowledge of God or his will for their life. They're lost people. They desire to eat up God's people as if they were eating bread. The same exact thing that we looked at here in Galatians and also prior in Psalm 27. <clears throat> a lost person who has no concern for God nor his people, what do they want? They live a selfish life wanting to hurt others for their own gain. Although the wicked can abuse God's people on earth, they will have to face judgment for their actions someday. And that's what the Lord brings out. 
There were they, being the people that were eating us up like bread, there were they in great fear where no fear was, for God had scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee. So I has put them to shame because God hath despised them. Talking about the final judgment of God against the lost for their mistreatment of the saved. Remember, we have that theme throughout the Bible. In Revelation, we have it where the martyrs are in heaven and they're asking, Lord, how long will our enemies get away with what they've done when they killed us? And the Lord says, be patient. There's coming a day they're going to stand before me in judgment and answer for what they've done. Remember that? That's in Revelation. You have that theme throughout the Bible where you have God's people abused by the world, the world not being judged immediately for those sins, but eventually... The Lord deals with those sins. Folks, remember, the Lord is a just God. He will always, always punish sin and He will always bless faithfulness. You may not see those things take place right away, but they will always take place. That's a theme throughout the Bible and it's included in here in Psalm 53. Job 31, 29-32. Job, once again, talking about his enemies, he describes them as, Oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. Okay. Here in the context, it's very important to get the context of this one. Job is speaking. Now, if you remember, at this point in Job's life, he has lost basically everything but his salvation and his physical life. He's lost his health, he's lost his family, he's lost all of his possessions, he's lost his friends, and he's lost his wife. He's sitting on an ash pile scraping boils with a piece of pottery. He has nothing left in life except his salvation and his physical life. He's still alive. He's scraping these boils on his skin with pottery. His friends come up to him and say, Job, why don't you curse God and die? That's what his wife said. Then his friends say, Job, you must have sinned for God to have treated you this way. Here in Job 31, he's talking to his friends and he's explaining how no, he did not have outstanding sin in his life. He had sinned, of course, nobody's perfect, but he had repented of whatever he had sinned. So he had no sin in his life that was unrepented of. They were accusing him of unrepentant sin. And they were saying, look, the Lord is bringing this upon you to teach you to repent. Job says, I've already repented. So he's telling them here, I rejoiced at the destruction of him that, that hated me. If I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me or lifted up myself when evil found him. Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. Job says, even my worst enemies I never cursed. I never wanted to see bad come upon them. He's saying, I'm innocent of these sins you're accusing me of. Job says, even the people that live with me will tell you that. If the men of my tabernacle, that's his servants, and the people that were the closest to him, if the men of my tabernacle said not, oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. David, or Job says, even my servants, even the people the closest to me that knew me the best, they never wanted to hurt me. They never wanted to take my flesh. They didn't say that they wouldn't be satisfied until they saw me come crashing down and they would gain it all. Job says the people that were the closest to me never felt that way about me because they knew me. They saw my life. They knew how I treated others. They knew how I had treated them justly. So here we're not even talking about people who want to eat Job's flesh. We're talking about Job is saying there is nobody that does want to eat my flesh. Meaning there is nobody who wants to hurt me for their benefit. He says even the strangers I treated right. The stranger did not lodge in the street but I opened my doors to the traveler. So here he's explaining to his friends who were accusing him of unrepentant sin. Job is explaining to his friends I don't have unrepentant sin in my life. I have done my best to treat other people the way I would have them treat me. I've done my best to love other people as God would have me to love them. Even the people the closest to me don't want to tear me down for their benefit. Because they know I've treated them right throughout my life. Final one, Isaiah 26, 19 and 20. Isaiah 26, 19 and 20. We've got to read these verses. 
Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Here we find Isaiah prophesying about what would take place in the future. Isaiah said, There's coming a day when the dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Stop there, right there to start with. Here Isaiah is saying, whatever resurrection this is talking about, he's a part of it. Isaiah was a man who loved the Lord. Isaiah is a man that was saved. Whatever resurrection Isaiah is talking about, he's talking about a resurrection of people who are saved. That's the first thing to understand. Thy dead body shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. So Isaiah is talking about a resurrection of God's people. At that time that they arise, this will take place at the end of time when Christ comes back. When Christ comes back, he'll resurrect his people. When they arise, they're going to awake and sing. What a wonderful thing it's going to be to enter into glorified bodies at the resurrection. Boy, we'll be singing about it. Think about the blessing it is to know our spirit is reunited with our bodies. Our bodies are glorified and now we're ready to live with the Lord for an eternity. No wonder Isaiah said, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. In other words, to our bodies. Awake and sing because now you're going to live in a perfect way, being glorified. For thy dew is the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Meaning, the dead bodies of the saints will no longer be in the earth. They will now be cast out and come forth to be with God forever. It's a time to awaken sing, saints. Your eternal blessings are about to begin. Come, my people. Then he talks to these same people he resurrected. My people, the people of God. Isaiah was one of these people. Now he speaks to the people he's resurrected. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. So now the Lord brings his people to himself. Hide thyself if it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Remember, that was God's judgment of the lost. It's the exact same event that we saw back in Zechariah 14. When God is going to judge the lost, but he takes his saved people out first to protect them from this judgment. Then he sends the judgment upon the lost that will involve them being consumed, remember, as they stand on their feet in Zechariah 14. And then we go with there with the picture. But the point is, this is a prophecy about the resurrection of those who are saved and how God will protect his saved people when he judges a lost world for their sins. Folks, that's what these verses are talking about. These same verses that some people would say are speaking about a zombie apocalypse. If we keep them in context, and it's so important to remember this, if we keep them in context with other verses in the Bible and with the context surrounding these verses, we can easily see they're not talking about zombies, nor are they talking about a zombie apocalypse of the future. They're talking about a variety of different events. So I hope the lesson that we can learn from this is twofold. Number one, the Bible never speaks about a zombie, nor does it speak about a zombie apocalypse. The second lesson, though, is the importance of keeping verses in context. Folks, I'm telling you, we can make the Bible say whatever we want to make the Bible say if we take verses out of context. Remember the one example I'd given you prior to this? The Bible says there is no God in Psalm 14.1. But if you look closer, it says, The fool I said in their heart, there is no God. So you can see how context is so very important to any subject that we study from God's Word. We have to keep verses in context. And these verses about the zombie apocalypse are no different. They have to be kept in the context for us to understand what they're really teaching. In part number three of our series, we're going to ask the question, Okay. If the Bible doesn't teach about zombies, and if the Bible doesn't say there's going to be a zombie apocalypse, then what in the world is taking place? Look at these different news stories. They're true. These things have actually happened. How can we explain these different attacks that are taking place if it's not the 
beginning stages of a zombie apocalypse? Lord willing, we'll be answering that question next time. May the Lord bless you as you seek his word.